Hello everybody, thank you for joining us. Today we're going to be talking about the update to the Genesee Fire Protection District's Community Wildfire Protection Plan. The analyses and report for the CWPP were prepared by the, by the Forest Stewards Guild on behalf of Genesee Fire Rescue. During this meeting, we're going to discuss the main findings from the CWPP share actions community members can take to reduce risk and increase emergency preparedness. You'll receive an update from Genesee Fire Rescue about some of their ongoing efforts that have grown out of the CWPP. And then we'll, some, we'll have some time at the end to answer questions and share resources for additional information. My name is Meg Matonis, and I work with the Forest Stewards Guild as the Intermountain West Regional Manager, along with my coworker, Karina Marshall. I have my PhD in forest ecology from CSU, and I've been an on-call firefighter with the Larimer County Sheriff's Office for the past eight years. Last year, I was assigned to the Cameron Peak Fire for seven days, and I've also participated in WUI fires in other communities. We're also joined by the three full-time employees with Genesee Fire Rescue, the Fire Chief Jason Puffett, the Training Chief Ryan Babcock, and the Wildland Specialist Dory Dalton, and you'll be hearing from Jason and Dory later in this presentation. Also instrumental to preparing the CWPP was the Genesee Fire Protection District Board of Directors President Scott Mefford and the Secretary Nancy Balter. During the live presentation on April 7th, we had a variety of agency partners in attendance and they started by introducing themselves. Unfortunately, that part of the recording was lost, but you will see Hal and Kevin, um, and I believe Andy as well, later in the presentation. So I'll just introduce them right now. So Hal Grieb is the Director of Emergency Management for the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office and Kevin is the fire management officer. And we had conversations with both of these gentlemen while preparing the CWPP to talk about emergency response. Also in attendance were Andy Perry, the program manager for Denver Mountain Parks, and Garrett Steffens, the director of the Jefferson Conservation District. We also had Brian Mallett from the Genesee Foundation. He's the open space manager. Nate Beckman, the Supervisory Forester for the Colorado State Forest Service, and Steve Murdoch, the Natural Resource Team Lead for Jefferson County Open Space, were not able to attend the presentation, but they were involved in conversations about priority fuel treatments in the Genesee area. Community Wildfire Protection Plans, or CWPPs, are important planning documents intended to inspire strategic action, they're not meant to be documents that just sit on the shelf and gather dust, and Genesee Fire Rescue is committed to moving the CW for, CWPP forward into implementation. CWPPs provide an assessment of risk across the community. The previous CWPP for the Genesee Fire Protection District was done in 2008, and conditions on the ground have changed since then as have some of the analytical tools and the quality of data available for fire behavior analyses. The CWPP also prioritizes projects that will make the Fire Protection District a safer and more resilient community to wildfire. It's also a call to action. There's a role for everybody in implementing the CWPP. Genesee Fire Rescue and land managers of um, open space within and surrounding the Fire Protection District obviously have a role but so do community members, residents, and homeowners associations. All of the CWPP documents are available online at the Genesee Fire Rescue website. There's a drop down that says wildfire info, and then there's a section for community wildfire protection plan. On this website is the executive summary for the CWPP, the very lengthy full report, uh, uh, frequently asked questions, a summary of the resident survey that many of you took uh, last fall, and then there's a link to a feedback form. We would like to hear from you, so after you read the executive summary and the full report, um, please click on that link and provide your feedback. The um, executive summary is much shorter and it indicates where in the full document you'll be able to find more information.
So we'll start by giving you some of the key messages. There's so much content. I wanna make sure that you at least know the main takeaways that we'd like you to be able to walk away from this presentation knowing. So one of them is that there is a high risk of extreme fire behavior across the Genesee Fire Protection District due to topography, winds, and fuel conditions. And those conditions are certainly not unique just to the Genesee Fire Protection District. They are shared by many of the Front Range Mountain Fire Protection Districts. Because of this high fire risk, there is a high potential for structure loss and dangerous conditions for firefighters that might be defending structures during wildfires, which makes it essential for residents to mitigate the, their property to reduce the chance that their home will be lost and that firefighters are at risk while defending their home. So there's also hope. So there, there's some concerning conditions around wildfire risk, but residents, Genesee Fire Rescue, HOAs, other community groups can do things to mitigate race, risks to their home and risks to firefighters by treating their home ignition zones. And collective action is what can really amplify the impact of these efforts. Uh, the limited egress routes in the Genesee Fire Protection District are concerning and create the potential for extreme congestion, slow evacuation times, and dangerous conditions along many roadways. And um, I have to share that when uh, I first came to visit the Genesee Fire Protection District when we were scoping this project, and I was joined by two of my coworkers who have each been in fire over 10 years, one of them 20 years. We were all struck by the evacuation concerns in your community. That was one of the first things that, that we noticed. So that's why there's uh, quite a bit of discussion about that in the Community Wildfire Protection Plan. Just like with fire risk, there, there is hope. There are things that can be done to address some of the evacuation concerns. So pre-planning, awareness, and strategic action can help mitigate some of these concerns. And then finally, one of the key messages is that ecological restoration and fuel treatments across the fire protection district and the broader landscape, so including areas that are managed by Denver Mountain Parks, by Jefferson, the Jefferson, um, Jefferson County open space can help create fire resilient forests and reduce the likelihood of high severity wildfires and help address roadway survivability concerns. I wanted to mention this idea of fire adapted communities because fire risk is a, a wicked problem. It's a very complex issue and it requires a multi-pronged approach to address it and to create communities that can safely coexist in habitats that will burn. And the reason I bring this up is I know there's, um, you know, there's there's always trade-offs. Like if you spend money on building an evacuation route, like you, you might have less money to spend on mitigating fuels, but you have to address things collectively. So you can't just say the silver bullet is is just treating the open space across our community. That's just one part of the the, the messy situation that creates concerning fire conditions and concerning um, safety conditions in your fire protection district. So the fire adaptive communities approach is communicating that you have to look at safety and ev evacuation. You have to look at wildfire response. You need planning, you need landscape treatments, and you need individual homeowners treating their home. I will quickly go through some basic terminology. I'm sure many of you are familiar with wildfires and wildfire behavior and um, like home ignition zone, uh, fuel mitigation, but I just wanna make sure we're all starting on the same page and using these terms the same. So fuels are anything that can ignite. So that includes live vegetation, dead vegetation. So trees, also dead grass in the understory, pine needles, pine cones, and then in the wildland urban interface, fuels also include homes, propane tanks, chemicals, lawn furniture, anything that can ignite. And high fuel loads result in intense fires with long flame lanes, and that can make suppression difficult and dangerous. And when we talk about fuels um, in terms of wildfire behavior, we're interested in the total amount of fuels and also their arrangement vertically and horizontally, and all of those affect 
I read here in connection with topography and weather. So when we talk about the horizontal arrangement of fuels, that is like the spacing between trees. And when we talk about the vertical arrangement of fuels, that is there's these different layers of fuels. So you have surface fuels, so that would be downed logs, short shrubs, grasses. Then you have ladder fuels that are taller shrubs and seedlings, low branches on trees, and then you have the canopy fuels. And ladder fuels are called that because they serve as a ladder that can bring surface fuel up into the crown of overstory trees. So based on fuel conditions, topography, and weather, there's several different types of fire behavior that can occur. So the main buckets of fire behavior that you would see in the ecosystems common in the Genesee Fire Protection District are active crown fire, which is mostly aerial fuels um, so the fire is ripping from tree crown to tree crown. And then there's passive crown fire where you have groups of trees that are torching, meaning fires moving from the surface into their canopy. But fire spread is mainly through the surface fuels. So you can have some trees torching, but the fire is moving along the surface and then maybe some more trees will torch. And then surface fire is mostly just occurring in surface fuels. You can have surface fires in forests, though, when you don't have ladder fuels that can carry their surface fire into the overstory. Active crown fires and passive crown fires are both concerning in terms of amber production and radiant heat damage to homes. And active crown fires in particular are very difficult to suppress and can create a lot of spotting, so fires that are being ignited beyond the main flaming front. Surface fires can also release enough radiant heat to damage homes. Um, I've been on fires in grasslands where I've had to put my gloved hand up because I thought my eyebrows were gonna singe off, but grass fires are easier to suppress. Across the Genesee Fire Protection District, there's a variety of different fuel conditions. So these are images that I took from across your community so on the left, you can see there's dense areas that have a lot of ladder fuels. They have a lot of low branches and regeneration and a higher risk for active crown fire. There's some parts of the community that have been well mitigated. So there are widely spaced trees that are also limbed. And then there's a grassy understory. And some areas also have mowed understories around the home, which will greatly reduce the kind of flame lanes that you could get. And these, fuel conditions would mostly support surface fires with moderate to fast rates of spread depending on grass height, and there could be some torching. And then there's a lot of parts of the fire protection district, particularly in the southwest, so the southeastern part that are grassy and shrubby where there are few trees and you would see surface fires with rapid rates of spread and you could potentially have high flame lights depending on uh, grass and shrub load. So the forests that you have in the Genesee Fire Protection Districts are uh, mostly ponderosa pine and mixed conifer. There's some Douglas fir and mixed conifer as well. And these forest types historically experienced frequent low to moderate severity fires. There was fire frequently enough that it would prune the lower branches of trees. It would kill a lot of shrubs. It would kill seedlings. So when you did have fire, it would move through the understory. For the most part, there's there's you know there's variation today in fuel loads. There's variation in the past, but today we are really missing these areas that have low tree density and really beautiful, rich understory meadow communities. These pictures just kind of hit home the change over time that has occurred due to over a century of fire suppression, um, changing of surface fuels due to grazing and then other management practices. On the right, you can see that's by um, the ski hill on the northern part of the Genesee Fire Protection District. And conditions there are still similar in terms of being really grassy, but there's a new fuel type in the area now, namely homes. And then in the background there, there's some evidence of hillsides that are now a lot more dense than they were in the past. And these changing fuel conditions 
greatly affect the kind of fire behavior that you might expect. Um, so forests that have been, um, where fire has been suppressed for a century, have a lot of understory ladder fuels, and you could get active ground fire that results in really extreme mortality. Whereas forests that are more ecologically managed have wider space trees and might experience just a surface fire or passive fire. So I'm mentioning all of this because it feeds into a lot of our recommendations about mitigating um, some of the like defensible space zones two and three, and then treatments in like open space for, uh, for the different HOA managed open space, and then some of the surrounding communities. The last term I wanted to go over is red flag, red flag warnings. Um, I think last year there were 15 of those. I'll have to check in the CWPP outlines, but there are over a dozen red flag warnings. And um, red flag warning criteria are specific to a region as defined by the National Weather Service. So the area that includes Genesee, you could have a red flag warning when relative humidity is less than or equal to 15%, wind gusts are greater than or equal to 25%, and you have dry fuels. Option two is regardless of the wind, if you have widely scattered dry thunderstorms and receptive fuels, it could be a day that's uh, constituted as a red flag warning day. And red flag warning day should be, um, if you hear it's a red flag warning day, I know Genesee Fire Rescue often posts on their Facebook page, so do other fire protection districts when it's a red flag warning day. It's a, a cue that you should stay vigilant and make sure your family is ready to go in case of an emergency. So I'm gonna go through some of the findings that you can find more details about in the full document. So a lot of the analyses depend on fire behavior modeling that we conducted using a fire behavior model um, flame map that has been robustly tested and developed over 40 years. And it's a model that is really commonly used by forest managers when deciding where to prioritize fuel treatments. And sometimes it's used by fire behavior analysts to predict fire behavior during actual wildfire incidents. It is a model. It provides reasonable estimates of relative wildfire behavior across the landscape but models are simplifications of reality and wildfire behavior is complex. So these models cannot produce specific and precise predictions of what will occur in the vicinity of your individual home during a wildfire incident. We also had to in, um, come up with different weather scenarios, but the weather conditions on the day of an actual wildfire could, you know, there's any permutation of wind direction, wind speed, relative humidity temperature that could occur. So we based our modeling off of um, observed extreme fire weather conditions in the area of Genesee. Fire behavior models do not include structures as a fuel. So we modeled conditions as if structures weren't there and it was just the, you know, the, the ponderosa pine grass ecosystem. So fire behavior could be even worse were you to factor in structures, but there's not a robust scientifically based way to do that across the landscape. So there's a lot of information on here. The main point I'm trying to get is that we had three different weather scenarios that we modeled. Um, 60th percentile is a little worse than average conditions. It means that um, only 40% of days during um, June, the middle of June to middle of October, which is kind of the traditional fire season, um, it's saying only 40% of days had more severe weather condition, fire weather conditions. Whereas for the 97th percentile, that means 3% of days, which would be about four days during the typical fire season, had more severe fire weather conditions. And the 97th percentile conditions um, correspond with what would constitute a red flag warning in the Genesee area. And it, so I have it here. It was five, there were five red flag warnings in 2019 and 16 in 2020. And then we looked at two different wind directions that are based on wind that is commonly observed in your community. So using the fuel conditions that we 
be developed based on aerial data for your community and those weather conditions, we're able to predict flame lengths. And the way that we present flame lengths here, this is for the 90th percentile weather and then the really extreme 97th percentile weather. We, the colors are associated with flame lengths in terms of how flame lengths affect tactical decisions. So when you have flame lengths less than four feet, you can have firefighters direct attacking building um, hand line and the hand line will hold. When flame lengths are between four and eight feet, you need equipment to do direct attack. And then when flame lengths are greater than that, you have serious control issues and you would need aircraft and aircraft might not even be able to um, suppress fires with flames that are that long and releasing that much heat. So you can see there's a lot of variation across the community in terms of where there's potential for more intense wildfires with a lot of area that could experience high severity fire by the Genesee State area. So the, the ski hill has conditions that could support really high flame lengths. A lot of the open space um, south of Highway 74 and then the southwestern part of the fire protection district. We also looked at crown fire activities. So under the 90th percentile weather conditions, 5% of the area within the fire protection district could have active crown fires and 60% could have passive crown fires. The percentage of areas that could support active crown fires increases from five to 20%. So a fifth of the area under 97th percentile fire weather conditions. Um, passive crown fires, even though they're not red on this map are still concerning for home loss because a flaming tree emits a exceptional amount of energy, regardless of whether it's catching its neighbor tree on fire or not. And a, a torching tree can emit um, embers. So the model allowed us to look at potential fire perimeters under the assumption that um, fire occurred for four hours with no suppression and we uh, simulated a thousand different random ignitions. And to help communicate that, I picked one random ignition location. And then this is displaying how big the fire could get and where it could go under the three different weather conditions on a day where you have winds coming out of the south southeast or winds coming out of the south southwest. And the Big things I want you to take away from this map are one, wind direction on the day of a fire has a huge impact on fire spread. Um, so the conditions on the day and the wind direction and speed change dramatically even during the day while there's a fire and fires can get so big that they start creating their own wind. So this is part of the reason why modeling fire, potential fire behavior is really challenging and responding to wildfires is challenging. The other thing that's really um, interesting to know is the size that wildfires could get within four hours um, under the, even under the more moderate fire conditions with the small size of the fire protection district. If you have an alignment of wind direction, you could get a fire that would cross a quarter of the fire protection district within four hours. Some of the simulated, uh, Simulated fires covered even like three fourths of the fire protection district in that time, assuming no suppression occurred. Using the output from the fire behavior models, we looked at roadway survivability. Tragedies have occurred across the United States, across the world. There's been a lot of examples in Australia as well. When flames from fast moving wildfires have burned over roads while residents are evacuating and residents can perish in their vehicles when they're trapped on the road, or egress routes can become blocked from flames. And uh, this is underscored by the, the death of 86 people in Paradise, California during the 2018 campfire. And many of those people were stranded on roadways during evacuations. And that, not to scare you, it just, it underscores the importance of evacuation preparedness and fuel mitigation along evacuation routes. 
And while in Colorado in recent history, we haven't had an, an, an incident of widespread fatalities during um, evacuation from a wildfire, just because it doesn't happen doesn't mean it won't. I, there is a real possibility of concerning conditions occurring and if a community isn't prepared for wildfire and that community has limited egress routes and high fire risk. So it's, it's great that your community is investing in this wildfire protection plan that Genesee Fire Rescue is taking this really seriously. And there's a lot that can be done to ensure that a tragedy doesn't occur in your community. So we identified non-survivable roadways as portions of roads that are adjacent to areas that could experience flame lengths greater than eight feet. And we use the eight feet cutoff because once fires, flame lengths are greater than eight feet, um, you can't even use machines to go direct against that fire. Um, these are two examples of roads that I saw in the community, the one on the left could experience these non-survivable conditions due to the density of trees, their close proximity, um, and some of the ladder fuels that are present. Whereas on the right, conditions would most likely be really short flame lanes that wouldn't create um, hazards for people on the road. So under 90th percentile weather conditions, 13% of the 56 miles of roads, private drives and driveways in the um, Genesee Fire Protection District and the Genesee States area could potentially experience non-survivable conditions. And that number goes from 13 to 31% under the more extreme fire weather conditions. So we use this map to make some recommendations about where people in the community should look at conditions on the ground and prioritize treatments. We also looked at structure exposure so homes can be destroyed in the wildland urban interface by multiple different means. So one is flames touching a home, although more common is radiant heat. So even when flaming vegetation is greater than 30 meters away from a home, um, the heat being released from vegetation could ignite the home. And then 50 to 90% of homes in a lot of wild and urban interface fires don't ignite from flame, but they ignite from embers. So you can get short range, short range embers coming off of adjacent homes or off of vegetation. And we used a hundred meter cutoff for that based on research out of British Columbia. And then you can get long range embers that are carried aloft into the convective column of a wildfire and they can travel way over 500 meters, but it's more common to have enough embers within 500 meters of vegetation that could actually ignite a home. So we looked at the percentage of homes that have different exposure levels to um, radiant heat and short and long range spotting. And this analysis does not account for any mitigation that you've done around your home because the models cannot take that into account. Um, but even if you've mitigated your home, your home is still at risk from short range embers from unmitigated areas outside of the district from you know, unmitigated neighbor's property. So if there's less severe fire weather conditions, a majority of homes are not exposed to radiant heat or spotting. But under really severe fire weather conditions, which happen and are possible and are the conditions that occur when you get fires like the East Troublesome Fire or the Cameron Peak Fire, over half of homes in the Genesee Fire Protection District could be exposed to radiant heat, long and short range spotting. Um, I see a lot of like, we're getting a lot of questions and we'll, we'll meet at the end to answer those. So just keep, Keep putting your questions in as they come up. So we also underwent an evacuation modeling exercise. We used a model called ARC CASPER and um, we had to make a variety of different assumptions in order to model evacuation for your community. So the assumptions that we made were that um, there were one or two cars leaving per residential address so we modeled everybody only having one car, and then we did the model again with everybody leaving with two cars. For 
both scenarios, we said there were 10 cars per business address. We said uh, there's a 30 minute prep time between when somebody receives an evacuation notice and when they leave. Ideally, that would be less than five minutes, but uh, there's a lot of people in the Genesee Fire Protection District who shared with us on the survey that we, um, that we distributed last fall. There's a lot of people who don't have go bags and feel like it would take them over 20 minutes, over 30 minutes to prepare to leave. We modeled three different evacuation destinations. Uh, we're assuming there's high visibility, so there's no smoke causing um, traffic issues. We assume smooth and efficient evacuation routing, responsible driver behavior, and simultaneous evacuations. So simultaneous evacuations mean that we were saying everybody in the fire protection district and um, Riva Chase and part of Kittredge all receive evacuation notices at the same time. And then the model picks who it evacuates, um, like the order it evacuates people so that it minimizes the time it takes for the entire area to evacuate to the safe um, evacuation destinations. So in some ways, our results are a worst case scenario because of the simultaneous evacuation condition. But at the same time, they're not the worst of the worst because we're assuming responsible driver behavior. We're assuming there isn't an accident that causes an emergency within an emergency and further creates congestion. We're assuming that there isn't smoke, which isn't realistic during a wildfire and smoke would reduce people's driving speeds, which would further increase congestion. We're also only saying there's 10 cars per business address, which might be reasonable in your community on a work day, but imagine on the weekend when there could be 100 vehicles at Flatirons Church, when there could be dozens and dozens of vehicles parked at um, Genesee Mountain Park. So it's, it's not exactly the worst case. Like there could be conditions that we can't model that would make evacuation even more um, concerning and difficult. We also looked at several different evacuation scenarios and those are presented in the CWPP and I'll show you an example of that in a moment. So this map shows congestion, which is change in travel time. So an area that is the bright pink has extreme congestion based on our modeling predictions. And extreme congestions means it would take 15 times longer to traverse that section of road than it would were there no other vehicles on the road. So not surprisingly, high to extreme congestion um, really accumulates in the northern part of the fire protection district due to funneling of roads to the two, two main points of egress onto I-70. Congestion um, is far worse if two cars were to leave each residential address, but even with just one car in each residential address, there is a lot of potential for congestion in the northern part of the fire protection district. This image shows um, predicted evacuation time in minutes for homes across the fire protection district under the assumptions that I described just a moment ago. One of the big messages from this map is that reducing the number of vehicles leaving per residential address decreases individual evacuation times by an average of 44%. So one of the important things to think about when it's time to evacuate is how many vehicles do I really need to take? Like nobody wants to leave their car behind, but nobody wants to strand their neighbors in the southern part of the Genesee Fire Protection District um, because you know, everyone's leaving with two cars and congestion is, is getting um, extreme and creating really, really, really high evacuation times. So based on the reality that people in the southern part of the fire protection district are pretty far away from I-70 relative to other parts of the fire protection district, we looked at a variety of different egress scenarios. So these are scenarios, they're hypothetical. It's not like the fact that we undertook this modeling is not a commitment on the part of Genesee Fire Rescue or any other party to build these routes. It's just important 
to look at potential ways to mitigate these concerning evacuation situations in the fire protection district. And there's a lot of conversations that still need to happen to make any anything a reality um, to this new grounds. Um, so this is the hypothetical southern egress route going off of Bitter Route Lane in the southern part of the fire protection district. And you can see how um, individual potential evacuation times would decrease significantly in the southern part of the fire protection district if there were an additional egress route. Um, there, there obviously needs to be discussions about these roads potentially traversing private property, um, you know, the cost, but there could be um, as much as like a 60% a decrease in potential evacuation times for some people were a new egress route to be constructed. So this is just one of the prongs um, involved in creating a fire adapted community and definitely worth having a discussion about based not only on the modeling, but also on um, you know, the, the Forest Stewards Guild, like combined like 40 plus years of fire experience in the WUI and our observations and concerns for your community. So one last result and then we'll get to what you can do. So the fire or the community wildfire protection plan has a relative hazard rating and this is required by the state for all community wildfire protection plans and it provides a good overall assessment of where priority actions should happen first. But this is relative hazard. So this is, um, if you live in an area that has a low relative hazard rating, that means yours is lower relative to a different part of the fire protection district. It doesn't mean low relative to um, other parts of Colorado. Every part of Genesee Fire Protection District has the potential for home loss from long range spotting. So there's concerns across the entire district. There's just some areas that have more concerns than others. And the southwestern part of the fire protection district is where we, um, based on our modeling and then driving around the community and doing an assessment of um, hazards around the home ignition zone, we think it's highest in the southwestern part because of some of the unmitigated fuels in that area and then um, high evacuation hazards due to the long distance from I-70. Um, let's see, we also looked at suppression challenges. So that would include how long and narrow are your driveways and are there turnarounds? And a lot of those results are presented in more detail in the CWPP. Okay, so there are things you can do. A lot of those results are kind of scary and concerning, but there, there is hope. There's a lot of communities who coexist with the realities of wildfire risk uh, along the Front Range of Colorado and other parts of the United States. So there are things you can do to mitigate your home ignition zone. So the term defensible space refers to um, areas around your home where fuels um, have been treated, cleared, or reduced in order to reduce the spread and severity of fire. Um, defensible space matters, uh, both in terms of if your home's going to survive, were there no firefighters, but the presence of defensible space can also dictate where firefighters are stationed. So homes that have clear defensible space um, and a safe area for firefighters to be stationed where a fire to burn over them while they're defending the home will receive higher priority. Those decisions are not made before a wildfire event. It would be made during a wildfire event based on observed fire behavior, based on the number of resources available. There's a triage effort that, that people, firefighters have to undergo because there's limited resources and you need to prioritize homes that have a higher chance of surviving, but more importantly, have conditions that are safe for the firefighters that are stationed there. So there's um, three different zones that are identified by the Colorado State Forest Service. Um, defensible space guidelines are going to be revised later this year, but the um, general principles are the same, just some of the, the designation of different change. But Zero to 30 feet from the home is where you need to 
aggressively mitigate fuels, um, mow the lawn, remove trees that, so that you don't have um, trees right up against your home, you don't have branches that are overhanging your roof. Um, then you have zone two, which is 30 to 100 feet from your home. You'd want to stack firewood in zone two. You don't want it right up against your home. You can limb trees um, out so there's no branches hanging less than 10 feet in zone two and increase the spacing between trees so it's at least 10 to 12 feet. It needs to be a lot more than that on steep slopes because slopes exacerbate fire behavior. And then in the larger area, which is zone three, so greater than 100 feet away from your home, you'll still do some thinning of trees and removing ladder fuels, but probably follow more of an ecological restoration type treatment, which I'll discuss in just a moment. So some of the defensible space guidance and some of the home hardening guidance is um, potentially inconsistent with um, HOA regulations. And some people express that concern when we shared the community survey. So that might be an area for community cooperation where residents work with their HOAs, where Genesee Fire Rescue works with HOAs to come to some agreement where you can still have beautiful homes and landscaping that is also more safe. Um, so home hardening involves changing building materials and other features of the home in order to reduce their flammability and reduce ember penetration. There's uh, some figures in the community wildfire protection plan that go over a bunch of different home hardening practices that you can do. These are just some examples. Um, some of them are expensive. So uh, changing your siding to something that is more ignition resistant like stucco or fiber cement, that would be a big undertaking. It, it's important in areas with high fire risk, but there's things you can do that are less expensive. So don't let, you know, don't just think home hardening means I have to replace my roof and I have to replace my siding. Like there's still other things that you can do with a limited budget to reduce the risk that embers enter your home. So that can include covering your vents and eaves um, and even as simple as using different kind of patio furniture. So you maybe don't want a wooden um, patio set on your deck, on your wooden deck. So changes like that um, and then removing uh, flammable material from your gutters and from around the base of your home can make a substantial difference in whether your home survives a wildfire. Okay, so now things that you can do around emergency preparedness, so specifically around evacuation concerns. There's a program called Ready, Set, Go, and uh, Karina will put a link to the Ready, Set, Go website in the chat. And the Ready, Set, Go program uh, helps you think about evacuation. So ready means be ready in case there is an evacuation. So that involves um, creating defensible space and home hardening practices. Set is you um, are prepared the day that there is a potential an evacuation. So you have a go kit uh, and you have a family evacuation plan. And there's some resources, uh, the Genesee Fire Rescue, Rotary, um, the Rotary Wildfire website, which we'll also put in the chat, has guidance for what you can put in a family go kit. So that would include things like prescriptions, emergency supplies, and then important documents. So on a red flag day, that's a great opportunity for you to make sure you know, where's everybody's social security card? Do we have everybody's prescriptions in a place where we could like grab everything we need and leave our house within five minutes? And then go is uh, what you actually do during an evacuation. And we'll have um, Kevin with the fire or Genesee Sheriff's Office share a little bit more about what that looks like in a moment. So how do you hear about an evacuation? In Jefferson County, the Jeffcom uses code red. And that's kind of, uh, it's like the nine reverse 911 system. And it's great. Genesee Fire Protection District has a really high percentage of people participating in the Code Red program. There's still a number of people who aren't participated, haven't participated and um, like 11% who've never heard of it. So hopefully 
some people who haven't heard of it are on this call and now you know about it. And some of the rest of you can educate your neighbors, make sure everybody is signed up for code red. Um, landlines are automatically registered unless your phone uses VoIP, but you can also register your cell phone and email address on the code red website and you can get to that through uh, the Jefferson County website and the link to it is also in the community wildfire protection plan. In terms of family preparedness, 35% um, of residents said that they don't have evacuation plans. Um, a lot of people said they do have evacuation plans, but a bunch of people said they don't have go bags. So if you don't have a go bag ready, your evacuation plan isn't complete. So the Genesee Fire Rescue website and Rotary Wildfire Ready have some more information about how to prepare your family for an evacuation. So now I'm going to pass it off to Kevin, so that he can talk about evacuation, the evacuation process. Yeah, thanks, Meg. Um, so this is Kevin Hawk. I'm the FMO with Jefferson County Sheriff. Um, talking about the evacuation process, um, some things to add on to what was Meg was saying earlier about how long it takes to get the evacuation going is that it can take anywhere from 15 minutes <clears throat> to just have the IC decide who needs to be evacuated um, take another 15 minutes for Code Red to be launched. And then depending on the amount of people um, that it's going out to, it can take anywhere from five to 15 minutes additional to that to get to all those people. So it, it takes a bit of time from when the actual IC says, this is who I need, who I need to get evacuated to it gets out to everybody. Uh, two types of messages that you'll get with the evacuation. You'll get a advisory, uh, which is basically just means something's happening. Uh, it could be a winter storm advisory. It could be, you know, high wind advisory. Just it, it'll tell you, you know, something's happening, just information, but you don't have to do anything. The other one is going to be an instructional um, advisor, instructional message. And that's where you're going to get the either a shelter in place, which basically means stay in your house, lock the doors, close the windows. Um, and then the two for uh, while and fire is gonna be a pre-evacuation, which means, hey, there's a fire in your area, be prepared to leave. So that means start getting all your stuff together, getting it ready to go. Um, if you want to leave, you are more than welcome to leave at that time. We are not saying that you have to stay in your house. It's basically just, hey, this is going on, be prepared. Um, the other one that's gonna be with that is gonna be evacuation order. And basically this is saying that you need to leave now. Um, <clears throat> have everything ready, get in your car and leave. <clears throat> um, part of that is gonna be, you know, if you're part of the Code Red. Um, if you signed up for Code Red, uh, that will go out to you. Uh, we have pre-designed areas that we can kind of put down and when we call it to dispatch, say, hey, this is what this is the areas that we need to you know, evacuate. Um, that will be coming from the IC. Um, that will not be coming from the Jefferson County Emergency Management because we're not on scene. We don't know what's going on yet. Uh, <clears throat> if the fire gets big enough, we might eventually get into that. But immediate action is going to be from who's ever on scene, who's ever initiating this. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, if you have any problems getting out, please call 911. Uh, you know, they'll get hopefully a, a law enforcement out to you. Um, with that, when you're leaving, law enforcement is basically just there to keep things moving. Uh, they're not really there to tell you which way to go. You know, I would say if you have a chance, drive yourself out to so you can kind of figure out which is the best way to get out in case of fire. Um, don't wait for the sheriffs to say this is which way you need to go. Uh, kind of know which way you're going to go before it even happens. Let's see. Um, that's pretty much all I have for the evacuation process. Um, the big thing is, like I said, you know, Sign up for Code Red if, you're, if you haven't already. Have a to-go bag, have things ready to go, kind of know which way you need to go. 
and just be prepared because like you said, we can happen at any time. Thank you, Kevin. If you have more specific questions for Kevin, feel free to put those in the chat. There's also um, some evacuation etiquette to be aware of. I've never had to participate in an evacuation. I've been in an emergency vehicle going against the flow of evacuation traffic, but um, these are included in the CWPP. And so just read through those. They include things like make sure that, you know, try to leave with as few of vehicles as necessary to make the speed evacuation times across the community drive safely um, and yield to emergency vehicles. So with our evacuation modeling, we only modeled, like if you have a two lane road, we only model traffic going one direction because you have to keep a lane open for emergency vehicles to be entering the area. So a little bit about some strategic and coordinated action to reduce risk. Um, you wanna avoid random acts of fire mitigation. Uh, treating your individual home can make a, a significant difference to whether or not your home perishes in a fire. But what can make a bigger impact is if you and 10 of your neighbors mitigate your fuels together and all of a sudden you've created a neighborhood where firefighters would feel safe staging and defending your home. And there's quite a lot of shared risk across the community. So over 95% of homes share, they're within short range spotting of at least one neighbor and some homes are within short range spotting distance of over 20 neighbors. So this is a, we have shared risk that needs to be addressed and um, resources like firefighters during an incident. And then also grant money that could offset the cost of strategic investment um, will be directed towards areas where there's a bigger um, strategic effort across property boundaries. So some of the fuel treatments that are outlined in the community wildfire protection plan would be relevant for just defensible space zones two and three. Um, larger fuel treatment areas like an open space or some of the surrounding public land. And um, our main suggestion is that you follow ecological restoration practices for these fuel treatments. Um, and then along roadways, create things that are more like a shaded fuel break so that diverges a little bit more from the ecological restoration approach and is a little more aggressive because the specific objective is to dramatically reduce flame lengths along roadways. Um, the recommendations are not for fire breaks and a fuel treatment is not a fire break. So a fire break is where like a really wide road could be a fire break because there's no combustible fuel. Um, a fire break could be a dozer line that's put in by heavy equipment during a fire or a hand line where all fuel has been removed down to um, bare mineral soil that, that won't combust. So fuel treatments, we're not recommending like scarifying the entire fire protection district to create fire breaks. These are fuel treatments. Um, a quote I wanted to read from a luminary in the fire management community is, Given the right conditions, wildlands will inevitably burn. It is a misconception to think that treating fuels can fireproof important areas. Fuel treatments in wildlands should focus on creating conditions in which fire can occur without devastating consequences, rather than on creating conditions conducive to fire suppression. So fuel treatments are really important and they're one prong of how to create a fire adapted community because under some conditions, um, fuel treatments aren't gonna prevent the spread of fire and fuel treatments can't prevent embers from entering a community. Nor could a fuel break, a fire break. A big wide fire break isn't gonna prevent the ability of embers to spawn into community either. So we prioritize treatments along roadway corridors based on potential roadway survivability and also based on evacuation congestion. So the areas that are in orange are the roadway sections that we're saying of like first treatment, first priority areas for treatment. And those are all areas that had high evacuation congestion and potentially non-survivable conditions during a fire. So this is based on our modeling exercise. So our recommendation is that 
people in the community, Genesee Fire Rescue, go onto the ground and look at these areas. Um, you know, these are where we, we generally think there's going to be areas that need roadway fuel breaks, but it need, you know, Forester needs to go on the ground and look at the area and make a specific plan. The, there has been some great fuel break work done across the community. So this was uh, a before and after picture of a treatment that was conducted by the Genesee Foundation. And um, something that I think is really neat to know is that a fuel break is that it doesn't have to be ugly. I think the forest on the right looks better than the one on the, the left. Um, you see that there's a, a removal of ladder fuel. So you actually have like a longer line of sight because the lower limbs have been removed and some of the shrubs. There's greater crown spacing. So there's more light that makes it to the understory and you have a lot more understory plants. Um, surface fuel loads could be reduced a little more if the grass was mowed, but um, surface fuel loads were treated in this, uh, were mitigated in this treatment. So limbs that were removed weren't just left on the ground, they were removed from the area. We also located and prioritized potential locations for ecological restoration um, or stand level fuel treatments within the fire protection district and in adjacent land. And we shared our assessment with some of the land managers who are present on this call and uh, shared what we were thinking and they shared some of their strategic plans with us. The uh, CWPP outlines these priority treatment recommendations, but we're not saying you shouldn't treat areas that aren't in one of these polygons. These are just areas that based on, sorry, Based on current conditions are uh, areas where there's a high, the, the highest risk for extreme fire potential that could threaten homes. Oh yeah, I and mean, if you look in the CWPP, the four areas that are dark brown that are like the fourth, four, the first priority, oh my goodness. Okay, <laughs> in the fire protection area, oh my goodness, an hour of talking and this is what happens to me, okay. In the fire protection district, there are four areas that are first priority treatment locations in brown. And you can see close up pictures of those in the community wildfire protection plan. And two of them correspond really closely with some of the prioritized projects for the Genesee Foundation. Whew, I got through it. Okay. Um, so the approach that we're recommending is one that is also being followed by the US Forest Service. It's being used by the Jefferson Conservation District and treatments that they're helping design and conduct. These pictures are actually from the Jefferson Conservation District. And the um, purpose is to recreate some of those historic forest structures, like I mentioned at the beginning, that have a lower risk of active crown fire. Um, there's fewer ladder fuels, higher crown spacing, and reduced surface fuel loads. And just like with that roadside fuel break, ecological restoration treatments, they can look a little shocking right after they're treated. You can feel like the forest has been destroyed, but even two years after treatment, the understory responds. You can have a lot of native plants that come back and it can create really great habitat, plus really reduce fire risk. I'm not gonna go into this too much. The, the CWPP outlines the importance of managing slash after fuel treatments and talks about all the different approaches to slash management and the pros and cons. Um, pile burning is a really effective way to manage slash that's been created by fuel treatments. Um, it's a highly regulated practice and it can be safe and effective when conducted by trained individuals who are operating under a burn plan under specific weather conditions. And uh, there's more information in the CWPP. So now, clearly I'm tripping over my words. Time for me to stop talking. I'm gonna pass it off to Dory and Jason and they're gonna talk about some of the great work that's being done already in the community. Thank you, Meg, I appreciate it. Good evening and thank you everyone for being here tonight and participating. As you've just heard and seen, and what will be reinforced is that our wildfire risk as a community, it's very serious, but it's not new, nor is it unique to our community. But acknowledging that risk and addressing it directly at every level within the community is critical because the reality is 
our community and communities like ours could very realistically lose hundreds of homes and businesses to a wildfire. So what do we do? Well, we start with a comprehensive analytical uh, objective assessment of our current situation. And then we outline goals based on risk priorities. And that is exactly what the CWPP process has done for us. Then we take those goals and we apply that data uh, that was generated throughout the process of building the CWPP and we implement it, we use it. And in doing so, we remove biases and we empower each one of us, whatever our role may be within the community, whether it's homeowners or business owners, whether it's local communities, HOAs, or whether it's the fire district. So collectively, we can reduce our fire risk. So we each have a role and it starts with most of you, the homeowners and the business owners. And the good news is, is that you've already started that process by just being here tonight and participating and being active and asking questions. So from here, I challenge each of you to, to dig in and to learn and to further educate yourself on not just what our risks are, but what are the alternatives? What are the solutions? What are best practices? And a great way of doing that is starting with the Genesee Fire uh, website. And there you'll find the full CWPP and, and executive summary and the FAQs and a whole host of other links to bring you to other sites so you get a broad perspective on the various solutions available to all of us. And once you've done that, my advice is make a plan, whether it's a family plan, whether it's a business plan, Meg mentioned Ready, Set, Go, uh, there's information on our site, but just the bottom line here is know what you're gonna do before you're put into that situation. With that, you then you harden your home, your business, you create a defensible space. And throughout that, you will be supported, uh, whether that's from the fire department, your local HOA or both, but know that the science of home hardening uh, is, is well researched, it's well understood and it's adopted internationally because it works. So the next role or, or, or area is the local communities. And I encourage all of you to get involved or even more involved than you currently are. And use the CWPP as it's intended. And that is as a tool or a reference guide. And I suggest you start by identifying your own plan unit uh, that you live in or you work in and then reach out to others within your plan unit and make a broader plan and knit those individual plans together so you can have a more meaningful impact. And that's really important because the majority of our residents have property lines and defensible space zones that overlap. So it is critical we all work together on this. And partner with your local HOAs, learn what they've done, learn what they are doing, what their future plans are, and rely on them and pool your resources and combine all those efforts to make the most uh, impact that we possibly can. From and throughout that process, I encourage you to reach out to, to your wildland specialist here at the fire department, ask questions, uh, participate in the educational initiatives that are gonna be rolling out soon and sign up for home assessments, which again will be uh, rolled out here soon. And you'll learn more about that in just a few minutes. But on a high level, it's important just to know the fire district is committed to supporting you through her role and it's focused on public education, uh, supporting grant initiatives, facilitating mitigation programs, managing and overseeing the home assessment program and partnering with you and, and your local communities. And then of course, the other role here in our community is the fire department. The most public facing role has historically been operations and continues to be, and that is responding to calls, deploying to wildfires, training throughout the district, conducting fire prevention programs, teaching our community education program, and hosting and participating in so many great community events. But as we continue to grow and evolve, um, the fire district has strategically taken a more prominent leadership role in the community. And that includes uh, building strategic partnerships with local uh, regional and statewide partners. Uh, it includes adding key staff, expanding our operational capabilities, uh, and identifying uh, and managing strategic projects, including this CWPP. Another example of a strategic uh, project that we are uh, working through is a result of this CWPP 
and that's the evaluation of feasibility of building a fire access or evacuation road in the southern portion of the district as recommended from the CVPP. Next slide, please, Meg. And we all know, or we, or we should know, that our community is effectively one way in and one way out. And the idea of having an evacuation route uh, is not new. It's decade old, in fact. But as we went through and we built uh, the CWPP, uh, the data, it just jumped off the page at us, uh, especially when we were reviewing the evacuation modeling and roadway survivability data. It was immediately clear um, that we needed to, at the very least, evaluate a secondary means of egress out of the district. So what would an evacuation road mean for the community? Well, first and foremost, it's life safety. It would give residents and first responders a secondary way out of the district in case uh, access to I-70 was impassable for any reason. Uh, Meg talked about that briefly a little bit earlier, but whether that's actual fire or heat, whether that's low visibility, um, from my experience, daytime turns into night when the front comes through. It could be as simple as a vehicle crash or a fender bender, uh, but it's also the reality that uh, fire apparatus, emergency responders, law enforcement, they're going to be going in the opposite direction of the evacuation. It's our responsibility, if time and life safety permits, to, to address that hazard. And to do so, we need access. And then secondarily, the benefit is tactical options. Uh, it provides a field break. It provides uh, wildfire, uh, firefighting options for us in an area that's very high risk and it's difficult for us to access. So there's several benefits. But with all that, there are a few key pieces to this solution, uh, including um, other aspects of improving our evacuation. And that is improving the roadways uh, throughout the district uh, with mitigation initiatives, with emphasis on those primary evacuation routes. Another is education. You know, it's my opinion that every adult and every child in this district needs to know exactly what to do if they're concerned about a wildfire in an area, if they see smoke, and even if they haven't seen or received any instructions. Um, all the way to that same resident receiving a reverse 911 notification saying evacuate now. We need to know what to do before the time comes. And of course, the third piece of that is we need a second way out. So as such, the fire department, along with the Genesee Foundation, contracted with Baseline Engineering, it's a Golden Base civil engineering firm, on a 50% cost sharing agreement to conduct a concept design analysis uh, for the construction of a fire access road uh, in the southern portion of the district. The intent of the study was to determine uh, if there was even a feasible route uh, in that area of the district that wouldn't cross any residential property, would be suitable for evacuation uh, in terms of uh, both grade and switchbacks, and would tie directly uh, into Highway 74. Through that study, um, they looked at four possible routes. Two were deemed not feasible for the above mentioned reasons, uh, specifically grade and switchbacks, but two were deemed feasible. Of the two feasible routes, one clearly stood out as being more desirable from a security or a limited access standpoint. But the question is, does it solve our problem? And the short answer is no, not by itself, it doesn't. But we have to understand too, but there's no single solution to this problem. But in conjunction with the other mitigation initiatives in the education, it would reduce the evacuation times for every person in this district and it would provide that secondary egress to the south that we need. Just in terms of cost, I won't go too far into this, but the cost estimate was included uh, for the two feasible routes, A and B. Uh, one was just over 854,000 and the other was just over 736,000 respectively with A being the more uh, desirable route. These estimates, they, they don't include mitigation. They don't include security up to, uh, upgrades um, to maintain uh, access for authorized personnel only. Uh, but it was just that, it was a feasibility study. I would encourage you to go on our website under other supporting documents in the wildfire section is the full feasibility study, along with every bit of information that we've created throughout this entire process. And I encourage you, everybody, uh, to read all of that. And I also understand that building a 
uh, a secondary means of egress out of the community uh, is important for everyone. It is a strate strategic project, but I'm also very sensitive to the fact that this would be a new road. It would have an aesthetic impact on some homeowners. So just know we will tread lightly and we're gonna work with, with those that, uh, that may be impacted. But there's much more to come on all of this. So at this point, I'm gonna hand this off to Dory, uh, but just know from the fire district standpoint, uh, we are fully committed uh, to transparency throughout all this. So thank you with that, Dory. All right, thanks, Jason. All right, good evening, everyone. Again, my name is Dory Dalton. Uh, I am your uh, wildland specialist here for the Genesee Protection, Fire Protection District. I've been a member of the community for the last nine years. My husband and I are both current uh, volunteer firefighters for the Fire Protection District as well. I'm here this evening to share the CWPP action plan for the 2021 year. As you look at the plan on the screen, you'll notice the benchmarks. The benchmarks identified are to help us drive the CWPP. These phases are fluid and at times will overlap each other. So in phase one, we've been creating, completing, and preparing to share the CWPP with you, the community. And in phase two, you'll notice the WIRE program. It's a wildfire research program that was established in 2007. And this program uses a systematic process that links professionally assessed wildfire risk information with social data. The specified research is to fit the community in order to find new approaches for integrating wildfire education and mitigation through rapid risk assessments and surveys based on social data. Now the WIRE approach has been implemented in several Colorado communities in um, Boulder County, Larimer County, Ure County, also in Montana, Washington, and Oregon State. And we're excited to partner with WIRE to reach more of our community members to help get out our CWPP message. You'll also notice in phase two, three, and four, educational webinars. And these webinars are planned to take place quarterly, and they're gonna be um, planned around need and interest of you, the community. And if you can't attend those, we will record them and we'll place them on the Genesee Fire Rescue website. As you look at phase three, you'll notice wildfire prepared home assessments. This is an in-depth home assessment program. It's currently being used in Evergreen and Elk Creek successfully. And other fire districts along the uh, Front Range are also adopting the program as well as uh, Genesee. It's also the only one of three programs recognized by the Community Wildfire Planning Center. You'll also notice uh, the ambassador program and we are currently exploring the needs of our community. And as you look at phase four, you see CWPP review and strategic planning. And this would be having our core group come back together and look at the benchmarks we prioritized and reprioritize for the 2022 year. We'd also involve stakeholders and community leaders in this process. Next slide, please. All right, on this slide, you're gonna see four highlighted programs. And the programs on this slide are opportunities for you, the community members, to take action on your property and become more prepared for wildfires. These programs are avenues for change. You'll notice the first program highlighted is the district-wide chipping program. This is a $25,000 grant offered through the Ready, Set, Go program. And we have applied for this grant. This grant will be offered district-wide. And we should be finding out anytime now if we have been awarded the grant. And this will provide an opportunity for, for you, the community, to start your spring cleanup. All right. You'll notice I've also um, highlighted educational webinars again, because I just want you to know that we are currently in the planning stages for our first uh, webinar. As you look down, you see a wiry program again. I wanted to give you a little bit more, of more information about what the rapid risk assessment is. And this assessment would be conducted on each Genesee community member's property. And this assessment only takes minutes and it's based on fuel risk factors, home materials, defensible space, and property access. And then we send surveys out to each one of the community members about wildfire readiness. All this data that we gather is analyzed in order to give us insight on how to best meet the needs of wildfire preparation in our community. You'll also see wildfire prepare again mentioned in the bottom. Um, and this again, this in-depth home assessment program 
will be uh, initiated by you, the community members. This is a two hour in-depth home assessment completed by a mitigation specialist based on specific criteria. The homeowner will receive a comprehensive report with photos and recommending actions to take. Once these uh, actions are implemented, your work is reassessed and the homeowners will receive a, a cert certification for proof of mitigation. Again, these highlighted programs are tools specifically for community members to add to their current toolbox. And you've seen throughout this entire presentation this evening, we've illustrated the importance of creating defensible space on your property. We're gonna apply for a cost share grant for private property owners to offset the cost of tree work associated with creating defensible space. Watch for emails and blasts with more information about this grant, or you can email geneseefiresafety at gmail.com, and I'll drop that in the chat box when I'm finished. And if you'd like to contact me, you can go to our website at Genesee Fire Rescue, and on the contact page, you can fill out a form and ask me a specific question, or you can email me at ddalton at geneseefire.org. I wanna thank you for your time, and I'm looking forward to working side by side with you to become more wildfire savvy. And again, I'll jump, I'll drop the email addresses in the chat box. Thank you. Thank you, Doreen Jason. I just wanted to, to repeat how lucky you are to have such an engaged um, Genesee Fire Rescue Group emergency response team in your community. They're really taking the results of the community wildfire protection plan serious. Seriously, and I'm impressed with how they're already moving the plan into implementation and addressing it from all different aspects. So really taking that fire adapted community approach. It'll be great to see what kind of work is done in your community over the next few years. So we have a list of resources here. I, I noticed in the chat, Karina has already posted a lot of these. So, um, and then a lot of these resources are also linked in the CWPP. So I'm gonna skip ahead to our question section. It looks like we have six minutes left for questions. Um, if we're not able to get to your question, um, we might add it as a frequently asked question on the Genesee Fire Rescue website. Some of the questions I've noticed will be you know, great areas where we'll add some clarification in the CWPP and then if you feel like those things don't address your question, you could reach out to um, Dory or that Genesee Fire Safety email that, you, that Dory just plopped in the chat box. So just as a reminder, these are our agency partners who are on the call today, um, except for um, Nate and Garrett. So if you have specific questions you would like to direct to them, that would be, um, that would be great. One I did wanna direct, direct to Kevin and how that I noticed was, if we're building a new evacuation route, how will people know which route to take during an evacuation? I don't know if either of you wanna take that. Hmm. <laughs> Elle, are you there? Uh, this is Kevin. Um, the initial contact that you'll get from the code red is basically just a kind of, you know, general, there's a fire in the area, get out. If there is time, um, there will possibly be a advanced, you know, you know, take, you know, go this direction or stay off of this road. Um, that all depends on, you know, what's going on at the time. Most of the time, it's just going to be a straight, you know, there's a fire in the area, um, you need to evacuate. Um, these are the sh like shelter locations that you could go to. Uh, and then if there's time, there might be another message that comes through that basically says, you know, evacuate, but stay off of this road due to fire behavior. And Meg, if I may, I'll jump in as well. The road is still in the conceptual phase. So what this will look like in the long term, uh, that's for anybody's guess at this point. Uh, you know, this road could go two ways if it, if it does proceed. Uh, one being is it's a, it's a uh, 
a regular county road uh, access by all. And if that's the case, if that's what the community would like or prefer, uh, then it's going to be finding your closest way out and 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 going. And that's otherwise directed by emergency personnel. But as I understand it, that's not the wishes of the community. I'm certainly open for input. Uh, it's it's then the short answer would be this is for emergency uh, egress or as directed by emergency personnel only. Um, otherwise, you will use your primary egress route uh, unless directed otherwise. So I think that's going to be your short answer. Thank you, Jason and Kevin. Did you um, see any other questions, Karina? Yeah. Um, there, oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, there have been some questions that I think were, were addressed, um, but a lot of, and Don just kind of asked again to the questions about kind of two-way traffic. Um, and there's been a little bit of concern about, about if I'm trying to decide where to evacuate, what is that going to look like day of if people are kind of coming in as firefighters and emergency personnel. Um, so I think just a quick kind of touch on that would be, would be great. And I have a few others as well that have come as private messages. With the, I don't know if Kevin or Jason or Hell could respond more of the, the two lane one way traffic would be, a, in my, pers my perspective, like a no go because you need a lane for emergency traffic. And if you have an accident during an evacuation, you need the other lane to get emergency vehicles around and have space to get around the accident. So I don't, I don't think that is done. I don't know, Kevin, is, is that accurate? Uh, yeah, Meg, that is correct. Basically, we try to keep it to just one lane going out just for what you said for firefighters coming into the area. So they have a they have an access way in. Um, if it gets to be a big enough fire, and I believe this happened up at the um, Cameron Peak fire, um, big enough fires, especially if we know it ahead of time, they can they can make it so it's two way traffic out. But most of the time, it's just going to be one way one traffic one way traffic, um, specifically so you can have you know egress into the area, and also if there like you said there is an accident, you can get around them. Thank you. But great to bring up things like that. You know, this uh, is a community effort to try to address the risk from wildfire and the evacuation hazards. So if people have creative ideas, like might as well bring them up and we can add them to the list of things to explore. Um, is there any other big ones that you think we should address right now, Karina? I think just one, um, if you could reiterate um, where some of the resources are in the CWPP uh, to where individual homeowners could address um, reducing their risk of home loss. There's um, been some comments publicly and privately just uh, address, kind of feeling concerned about um, not being able to prevent home loss. Great question. So the Chapter four of the CWPP has a lot of tables and figures that have some specific actions that you can take. And in a couple places, we highlight low cost actions that you, could that you can take for both uh, hazard mitigation and also home hardening. So that section also has some links. So when you look at it online, you'll be able to click those hyperlinks and go to um, different online resources that have great information. The Colorado State Forest Service is a really good go-to and they have publications about home hardening and publications about defensible space. And I know they are updating those right now. And then Dory is a fantastic local resource that you can use if you have specific questions, if you go to some of those resources and it doesn't provide enough guidance for you. Um, she just shared that she's open to having you email her directly. So that's a fantastic resource. And then I also wanted to mention that later this spring, maybe early summer, the Forest Stewards Guild and Genesee Fire Rescue are going to organize a community walking tour where we're gonna go to some different properties that have 
there, there are some properties in your fire protection district that have exemplary defensible space. Like I took a picture of it and labeled it exemplary defensible space. So we'll talk to those landowners and see if they're willing to let us go onto their property and see what they've done to create um, fire safe conditions and harden their home. Um, and then during that community walkthrough, we'll have some handouts that we can also share. So uh, I know Jason and Joy will make sure that is, uh, is known across the community. It'll probably be attendance limited, but we'll uh, record it and it's some, an event that could be repeated in the future. And Meg, if I may, the home assessment program that Dory will be launching shortly uh, is, is exactly what those folks I think are, are looking for. It, it starts at the structure and works its way out. And it's not conceptual, it, it, it's very practical. It gives very detailed checkbox, do this, here's a picture for reference later on. Um, and it's a very involved, it's voluntary. Uh, anybody that has interest will be able to apply and a certified specialist will come out and work with the homeowner directly. Uh, that would actually require the homeowner to participate in the entire survey uh, for the intent of uh, education, uh, but also to make sure that they, they have a say in the process. So the end result is both um, uh, meets the requirements of the fire district and wildfires, but it meets the aesthetic and the practical purposes of that homeowner. So more to come on that. Thank you. So we're, we're over time, but we will document all the questions that have been asked in the chat. And like I said, we might create some more FAQ responses on the website. Um, please read the document and uh, respond on the survey. Give us feedback on what information was useful, what information you think maybe needs um, some more explanation. And we're, we're going to take those comments seriously and read through all of them and see what we can address and what we can't. Not all of it can be addressed in the CWPP, but I know Jason and Dory um, and Ryan wanna see all of those comments and see if there's other educational programs that they wanna design to help address some of those community concerns. So thank you so much for participating. I'm really excited by how many people join it. Just it attests to how many people in your community see this as an issue and hopefully wanna to work together to find a shared solution.